All right. Greetings. You are listening to and or watching Cantus Firmus. I'm Cody Cook. My guest today is David Ritchie. David Ritchie was born and raised in the West Texas city of Amarillo, where he serves as the lead pastor of Redeemer Christian Church. He holds degrees from Amarillo College, West Texas A&M University, and Reformed Theological Seminary. Most significant for our purposes, he's also the author of Why Do the Nations Rage? The Demonic Origin of Nationalism, which we'll be discussing today. David, thanks for being here. Cody, honored to be on with you. Thanks so much for inviting me on your show. Oh, happy to have you here. And we'll, and we'll, get, in, we'll get into why you're here in just a little bit. But uh, first, uh, can you tell me a little bit about like your religious background? I saw you went to Reformed College. Or are you Reformed yourself? So, yeah, my in, in many ways, I'm kind of just a, a mongrel mutt of Christian culture in the United States. I I primarily grew up in a more charismatic leaning um, non-denominational megachurch. And so that was a, a, a massive part of my my spiritual background. And um, in some ways, uh, the, the church culture that I grew up in did kind of flirt a lot with Christian nationalism. And, and so in many ways, the exposure to Christianity that I initially got had kind of like that Christian nationalism flavor to it. Um, but I, I did um, come to faith in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ at the age of 19. Um, I was reading the book of Romans and just kind of um, the Holy Spirit opened my heart and showed me the, the beauty uh, of the gospel. And in that, um, I really came to the conviction, if this is true, I, I want to give my life to seeing this gospel going forth. And so I did come on staff at a local church for a period of time. I did college and young adult ministry. And then at, at a very young age, I felt a call towards what I thought was going to be planting a new church, but I ended up replanting one of an old, one of the older churches in our city. And so I was born and raised in Amarillo. I'm, I'm from West Texas. Um, this, is, this is my people and, and I love being sent here. And uh, for the last 11 years, I've been the pastor of what is now called Redeemer Christian Church. And we've really just seen kind of a miracle of a restored church. It was a church that was on the verge of death. And by the grace of God, we've seen the miracle of new life happen. And so um, I am definitely influenced by the Reformed tradition. Um, I did go to Reformed Theological Seminary, but uh, the, the truth is it's uh, I, I do uh, see value in a lot of different um Christian traditions. And I, I, I drink from a lot of wells in that regard, but I'm grateful for Reformed theology and it's in the way that it conveys a sense of a very big God, um, that the, the very centerpiece of the gospel is, is not mankind. It's not humankind. It is a, a God of glory who is revealed perfectly in his son, Jesus Christ. And I really do uh, deeply appreciate that about the Reformed tradition. Did, did you go to the, uh, the Jackson, Mississippi campus or... So how the global campus works is there's lecturers from all kinds of different campuses that contribute to the, the online portion. And so most of my professors were out of uh, Charlotte and mm -hmm. I had a few that were also out of Orlando. And then um, the person who was uh, the advisor for my academic thesis was a man named uh, Dr. Paul Jun, and he pastors um, a church in uh, Washington, D.C. I mean, he's a part of their D.C. campus. And so, okay. um, and, and I don't know if, if you were aware of this or not, but my book, Why Do the Nations Rage, actually began as a thesis. Oh, at, cool. Uh, Reformed Theological Seminary. And so um, I, I was doing um, uh, work in completing my, my master's degree ended up writing this thesis and I, I literally turned in the final two chapters of my first draft early on the morning of January 6, 2021. And oh. uh, my professor who's living in DC, um, you know, says, I, I think that uh, we'll get you past the defense and then you really should um, think about turning this into a book proposal rather quickly, just because of how timely, timely. this topic is. And yeah. um, I, I think that, um, there'll be someone that would be interested in it. And, and I'm grateful for the opportunity um, to be yeah. able to be published um, for that reason. Yeah. Well, and, and well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about your book, but, but part of, part of why I wanted to have you here is because we wrote a very similar book and Absolutely, um, yeah. th th there's, and th there's some um, differences, which are interesting too. Like um, one thing that, that you did that was a little different than what I did was, so my book was fight the powers. Um, uh, what the Bible says about the relationship between spiritual forces and human governments. Thank you. Yeah. And um, we both, so you wrote yours at the tail end of the Trump presidency. I wrote mm -hmm. mine right in the middle of the Trump presidency. Yeah. And, and um, one thing that's a little bit different is like, I'm, I'm not a pastor and I don't necessarily think pastorally. I think just kind of more, a little bit more academically. And um, I didn't want to make the Trump connection 
as explicit because I was kind of thinking like, you know, this could be something that somebody could pick up any time. But there, there is something, I think, very pastoral about um, and also just I, I kind of remember thinking like, you know, this kind of would have been maybe a better book for me to write after January 6th because it became such a big kind of bombastic um, moment that sort of highlighted this kind of danger of nationalism. Um, so anyway, just it's an interesting difference between our between our books, but um, I think it really worked in your favor because of how how timely uh, you know your your book ended up being because of that. You know, um, certainly. So uh, I don't want to go too far afield. It was interesting you mentioned having sort of a charismatic background um, uh, because you know we're talking about nationalism, Christian nationalism here, um, and uh, I think I think I think you're familiar with their work. Is it Esther Akalazi, the African mm-hmm. uh, theologian? And, yes. and she sort of pointed out that there's a there's a lot in um, this sort of charismatic theology that is primarily that she sees in Africa uh, that's really relevant to this sort of question of the relationship of the powers and the, you know the, the 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 spiritual powers the negative spiritual powers in the state um, and yet it's so interesting in America we the, char- the charismatic movement is very tied in with nationalism that they haven't quite made that connection and to me a, a lot of what you and I are, are kind of doing is picking up a lot of low hanging fruit, a lot of stuff that is so, mm-hmm. you know, that, that scholars acknowledge, but they haven't quite, quite synthesized it. It's kind of, it's all there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and in that sense, what we're doing isn't really new. We're just sort of pointing out connections that, that, that haven't been made to stuff that everybody pretty much acknowledges. Absolutely. Um, like, I mean, the whole idea of both what your, your book and my book are arguing for is very common knowledge in Old Testament studies. Um, yeah. Many Old Testament scholars would be able to acknowledge a, a level of the Bible speaking to national patron deities and how that was such a dominant religious feature in the ancient Near East and how this is going to evolve into the Apostle Paul's doctrine of you know the principalities and the powers. And the, it's, it is that, that final step, though, that I think is so important and so helpful in this yeah. moment it, is to be able to say that this biblical category actually is is hugely important for us to be able to understand some of the the religious and the spiritual agency that seems to animate so much of the 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 political moment um right now um, that we see kind of infusing various different political ideologies and so it is something in fact um i don't know if you've come across the book by daniel i block called the god of the the gods of the nations but in his very first sentence he mentions nationalism, but then he hmm. never talks about it again, the rest of the oh, book. Wow. And uh, I, I remember coming across, that was one of the early resources I came across. And I'm like, man, I want you to talk more about that nationalism thing, because I think that the Bible has something to say about this huge part of our experience yeah. um, that is that is fascinating. Because, I mean, most of the people that are experts um, are coming from a more of a social scientist position. You know, they're uh, historians and social scientists, political scientists, um, uh, sociologists that are describing um, this phenomenon. But I, I think that the Bible has the ability um, to give us a lens that is able to describe the spiritual agency um, that yeah. seems to infuse this in a way that hmm. is um, really important to be able to understand and and bring into the conversation. Yeah, I you know, I um, I haven't read that book by Block, but I'm, I'm familiar with Block, um, at least his work. Um, I, I, I don't want to make it, make an assumption about um, his motivations, but it, it seems to me that um, I, I wonder if uh, maybe he sort of wanted to throw in that reference, but felt that it might be a little dangerous territory to go deeply into that sort of thing, which makes, I guess, the question I would ask for you is, did you find it difficult to find a home for this book, knowing that you were kind of bringing up these sort of, you know, especially because your book in particular really does sort of go deep into these, okay, well, here's some examples that might upset you if you have a certain political tribe to hear. Um, was, was it was it t- tough to find that? Did you feel like you're policing your tone or uh, trying to trying to you know modify what you were saying to, to to please an audience? Yeah, I mean it's it's a great question because this is a, a uniquely vicious idol. Whenever it's attacked, whenever it's confronted, when it's exposed and pointed out, it tends to fight back with a vengeance. And yeah. so, I mean, anytime as a, as a preacher of the word of God, when we confront idols, there tends to be a blowback. Mm. This particular idol has the most vicious blowback. Um, yeah. You can um, 
even in the most gentle and persuasive of tones, try to be able to address this. But people will oftentimes find themselves very suspicious of your motives, um, saying basically, well, does this mean that you're against my political team? Therefore, you're for the other political team. Um, and, and there can be um, just a, a lot of guards that come up. And so in, in many ways, I, I've tried to be able to to balance that um, the best that I can um, by not toning it down in order to police or protect myself, but more so to try to make a book that is persuasive as possible. Mm. You know, I, I think about in many ways that, you know, the word of God itself, it tells us that idols have this capacity to blind us. You know, Psalm 115 yeah. says, you know, um, they have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. And those who worship them become like them. And so there's this blinding effect that idols have on us. And, and for that reason, um, we have to engage them in, I think, very creative ways. And so um, one thing that I think is really helpful is that it's always easier to deduce an idol when you're talking about someone else's idol. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so in that way, it's I do try to utilize in my book examples of nationalism and Christian nationalism that are not only about America and that are not only of one particular uh, political ideology in America, but to use multiple instances and um, uh, examples from the history of the world to show yeah. that this tendency to worship one's nation as God and to have a very spiritual devotion in, in that worship is one of the most ancient and enduring forms of human idolatry that has ever existed. I mean, mm -hmm. it is arguably the oldest form of pagan religion. I mean, we go and we, we look at artifacts and dig up certain um, things from different cultures and almost invariably the earliest forms of religion, there's some type of fusion between um, the, the, the deities that are being worshiped in the state that is having dominion over yeah. a given society. And so I, I do think that um, that helps us open the door to be able to understand, well, maybe we might be susceptible to these same things. And so um, there, there's a wonderful poem by Emily Dickinson that uh, says, you know, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. <laughs> and, and she uses this this visual illustration of being blinded by a sudden burst of lightning, that if you see all the light at one time, it just blinds you, but that, that the truth has to dazzle gradually. Hmm. And, and I think that in the pastoral enterprise, there, there has to be um, an expectation that in some sense, our hearts are prone towards this idolatry. In fact, Calvin himself said, you know, the heart is an idol factory. But even mm -hmm. more than that, our culture is actively catechizing people into this, this type of dogma um, through cable news or social media. Um, we are being formed all the time into a worldview that oftentimes... Uh, encases itself within Christian categories and gospel categories. And for that reason, it can really um, grab a hold to not just our minds, but the religious affections of our heart. Yeah. A couple of things you said uh, brought, brought different things to mind. One is, um, you know, that it's not just this kind of, it's, it's easy to sort of just sort of cast aspersions on the religious right or something in the United States and say, that's, it's, it's uniquely this, you know, us problem or their, their them problem, depending on how yeah. you fit into that. Uh, I just seen something the other day where, uh, you know, Dr. Michael Brown, who's definitely more of a conservative, mm -hmm. he put together a collection of clips um, from it was largely like kind of the more liberal black church where they were, um, you know, uh, bringing in politicians and praying over them and talking about it was like they were sort of like fighting this battle, this you know, great godly battle against the demonic, meaning like yeah. the Republicans. And um, it, yeah, it was pretty it was pretty fascinating how a lot of that same language gets borrowed, but it doesn't get looked at scrutinized in the same way because it's not coming from the right. But it's it's definitely a problem you see on both sides, um, and and yeah. And as for the, the um, maybe it being the most ancient um, idol being the state, um, I, I can't help but wonder. And that's something I want to work on a little bit more. Um, the, the idea in Genesis six of the Nephilim, the mighty men of old, who are half god and half man. Um, there's I think at least um, partially here a critique of these of pagan this pagan view of kingship. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, you know, Israel is under God as their as their head. Um, and then they sort of beg for a king later. But um, whereas that the nations sort of say, well, you know, our kings are our gods. You know, they're yeah. these sort of happy, semi divine beings. And isn't that wonderful? And they're so wise. And and and, and God says, actually, it's, it's not wonderful. And that's why the world you know, really deserves to be destroyed. <laughs> and so the flood comes immediately after. Um, but 
So I, I'm curious, um, when did you start to notice the biblical data on the relationship between nations and demonic powers? Because for me, um, I mean, I saw this stuff kind of early on, but we talked, I think before we were, I think it was before the recording, we were talking about how it's hard to see something maybe when you're not inclined to see it. But once you sort yeah. of put those lenses on, you can see it everywhere. Um, and for me, I came into Christianity sort of first as this kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of politically radically awakened teenager or whatever. And so when I like would pick up and I was interested in Daniel and revelation, all this kind of weird stuff. Yeah. And I'd like read commentaries and, and stuff from guys who were, you know, maybe more, you know, politically conservative and really kind of in that movement. And they would acknowledge this stuff like in Daniel 10 and Daniel seven and Daniel two and revelation 12 and 13. And, and so, you know, it just seemed weird to me that, that everybody acknowledged that this was here, but nobody seemed to like, do anything about it. It didn't seem to affect their theology in any significant way. Um, so I guess my question is, when did you start to notice that yourself and, and put that stuff together? So, yeah, I mean, in going to reform theological seminary, which is a, a, a fine institution, there was very little instruction about the field of demonology. Um, it was one of those things that, um, I don't think it was necessarily even purposefully neglected. Um, but it was something that, uh, was, was simply not talked about. And so, and I, I think there's reasons for that. I think we, we've talked about um, Walter Wink in both of our books and something that he said in one of his books, I can't remember which one, but he talked about like, you know, once we get past the enlightenment, there's barely enough room for God <laughs> in our worldview. And so angels and demons, they're just like a, a luxury um, that we cannot afford to indulge right now. And so I, I do think that there is this tendency in Western theology or modern post enlightenment Western theology to de-emphasize um, the spiritual and de-emphasize the powers. And so in some ways, my experience in this more kind of like charismatic upbringing, you know, I, I have this, this lens and this intuition to, uh, you know, want to see these things and be aware of these things. But then I have, a um, kind of like this more formal, um, historic theological outlook that seems to not necessarily know what to be able to do with it. And, and that, was a tension that I honestly, I had since the beginning of my theological studies is man, like this, does reformed theology even have a, a distinctive outlook on demonology? And that was just something of a, a background question, but really there's a nexus of three things that happen in early 2020. Um, Number one is I'm a pastor during 2020, which is just this unbelievably stressful period of time, you know, where we slam into this pandemic where everybody is trying to figure out how to lead and how to minister in this very uh, bizarre, unfamiliar world. We go into um, the death of George Floyd and, and the riots that come after that. Then we go into a political um, election that is unbelievably polarized, and then that election is contested, you know, and it kind of culminates in this January 6th experience. And so all of that is the background during which I'm kind of like going through this theological discovery. And um, early in the year, I remember really doing a deep dive, particularly in the book of Ephesians, and just noticing how neglected the theme of power was in a lot of the commentaries that I was reading, but how it seems to be the most dominant theme in the book of Ephesians, um, kind of, I, I saw Ephesians through this lens of the power of God versus the powers of darkness. And, and I wanted to unpack what that meant. And so I, I just followed a few footnotes and started kind of tapping into this old Testament, um, scholarship tradition where people are talking about the powers and talking about Deuteronomy chapter 32 and understanding, um, the, the, the patron national deities that are such a spiritual force, not just dead idols, but an actual spiritual force that seem to hold the nations of the world in darkness and that somehow the, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ dethrones and delegitimizes those powers just began to be um, a radically beautiful notion to me. Um, it was something that really did legitimately fascinate me. And the first time I started kind of applying that to a cultural moment was in a conversation I had with some fellow pastors right around the season of George Floyd's death. Um, because if you really do look at a book like Ephesians and Colossians as well, and you're looking at what are the powers doing? Um, they, they really are trying to en enslave the people of God to fall back into their their old ethnic allegiances. Um, they they really do want 
Jew and Gentile to have their primary identity, their primary uh, allegiance to be towards their ethnicity, to their national heritage, their national culture. And there's this interesting coordination with, you know, being spiritually dead under the powers of darkness and being separated from one another and this wall of hostility um, that separates these ethnicities. And, and likewise, whenever Christ is able um, to bring these people together um, in unity, it is a display of his manifold wisdom to the powers. Uh, it, it's something that in, in many ways is, is Christ showing his supreme glory. And so I began to be very interested in that idea. And then right around the same time, the third kind of stream that came into it, as I was reading um, uh, a, a kind of a theological classic in the Reformed world, which is Dre Gresham Machen's Christianity and Liberalism. And I was just really kind of fascinated and amazed at his lens of critique. Basically, he's taking theological liberalism and he's saying, look, it's using the language of the Christian gospel. It's, it's using the language of Christian dogmatics, but it's using those terms to convey something that is different than historic Orthodox Christianity. It's basically just modernism repackaged in the Christian gospel. And I, I remember thinking, you know, I, I wonder, you know, a hundred years later, after Manchin is writing, if there's something in my life, in my community that uses the language of the Christian gospel, but is not Christianity. And as soon as the question was formulated in my mind, I knew that the answer to that question was Christian nationalism. And I began to kind of do what I do later on in my book, which is to go through the Apostles' Creed and show that for each distinct category of Christian doctrine, nationalism has this unique capacity to co-opt it, um, to offer a mirrored distortion for that doctrine, to use it to advance the nationalist cause. And, and that, that's the thing that um, really motivates my work on this subject from a theological perspective is, is it really is a, a pastoral response um, to something that I see as a, as a threat to the people of God. And so a particularly pronounced threat in my own community, because I'm in rural West Texas. Um, it's a, it's a deeply conservative community that for that reason can be at times uniquely susceptible to Christian nationalism. Um, and so my concern about Christian nationalism is not that, you know, our politics are getting overly influenced by Christian values and Christian ideas. It's, it's actually the inverse. It's that our Christianity, our, our gospel is being distorted and maimed in order to fit into this Procrustean bed of our political allegiances. And, yeah. and I felt like that needed to be addressed um, from pastoral context, just like any other Christian heresy. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you kind of mentioned this um, squeamishness that we have in the West of having too much spirit, uh, supernatural stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and then, you know, also other other uh, thinkers that come to mind on that would be like Charles Taylor and his book, A Secular Age, and yeah. uh, Michael Heiser's work. He's pointed out a lot that, you know, we really need to return to this biblical worldview instead of this kind of Western worldview where we're trying to remove the supernatural as much as possible and get it down to just, you know, it, it's, not, it's, 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 it's like negotiating a prison term down. It's like, okay, we just want one supernatural being, you know, that's all we really want is just the one. Uh, and, um, but I think we also, another problem uh, is that we, we have, I think maybe a complicated witness in scripture to these notions of God's sovereignty juxtaposed with demonic influence over the state. And, and, I, this may be even a tough issue for, for reform folks because, you know, um, they emphasize God's sovereignty and divine determinism, but it's honestly tough for all American Christians. I mean, you know, the reform may have this sort of like theonomy movement, but, but that kind of thinking, um, has, has gone into Pentecostals and Pentecostalism and, and Baptists I mean, who are supposed to be these kind of separatists, uh, at yeah. their core. Um, and so I think it's tough for all American Christians who see their political heritage as a religious one. Um, and, and so, I mean, how do we disentangle those two things so that we're seeing politics through a gospel lens and not the gospel through a political lens? Yeah. I mean, one is just simply being aware that the temptation is there gives us the ability to at least back up and say, Hey, I know even I could be prone to this. Uh, I could be prone to instrumentalizing my faith in Christ for this worldly political end. Um, knowing that we're just, we're not above it. I mean, again, this is such an ancient and enduring form of 
idolatry um, should give us a, a sense of pause to be able to be discerning in these matters and to know that we should even approach this conversation um, with the utmost humility. But I, I'm really intrigued right now by the, the confessing church movement in Germany um, during the rise of, of the Nazis to power and, and how they're so adamant um, that the church has to be ruled by Christ. Um, that its agenda has to be the proclamation of the word of God, that it has no other Fuhrer except for Christ, that he is the Lord of the church. It has no other agenda or message other than the word of the gospel. And, and so I think that there are times that we need to hear the voice of our brothers and sisters from Christian history and, and be able to to make some connections. And, and so for that reason, I, I think it's really important to be able to just say a profound no to that impulse. Um, you know, the biblical example I can think of would actually be Joshua in the very beginning portions of, of the Old Testament book of Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And he's amazed at the angel of the Lord. And you would think that, you know, the angel of the Lord um, is basically just there to, you know, only help out Joshua's agenda. But when Joshua encounters him, he says, are, are you for us or are you for our enemy? And I love the response. The response is just no. <laughs> He's like, we're not going to reduce God to our mascot for our agenda. Um, that he is inviting us to his agenda, um, not the other way around. And, and so um, it is it is something that is um, a particularly powerful, um, spiritual alluring temptation. Um, but I think that in many ways you can instrumentalize any the Christian doctrine towards this end. And so, whereas theonomy folks might be more tempted to um, stretch, you know, sovereignty to um, endorse a certain political outlook. Uh, I just re recently um, came in contact with a scholar named Matthew D. Taylor. He does a lot of work on the new apostolic reformation. Um, I actually had the opportunity to uh, be on a panel with him and um, spend some time with him at the American Academy of Religion. Um, that just happened in uh, Denver. And he actually shows how the outlook of open theism is so unbelievably important to the political outlook of the new apostolic reformation, because essentially every prayer rally, every worship event is essential because God's move and God's promises are all contingent upon our agreement with it. And, and so the prophets might be declaring these promises of, of great blessing or great threats, but it's really dependent upon, you know, the apostles to decree the right thing at the right moment or for the, the, the people who are attending these moments to be praying together and fervently worshiping together in order to kind of release that blessing um, to, to come into a, a spiritual uh, promise into the realm of, of, of earthly reality. And so that just gives you the, the ability to see something like the worship um, events that are surrounding the, the Capitol riot in, in a way that that shows the unique contribution of these theological ideas being instrumentalized for a particular political purpose. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, one difference I think um, in our book, I think it's a very important difference and in, in maybe in, I'd say in the favor of your book is that um, I am, you know, I approach things more kind of in the head, you know, so I, I have a tendency to think of uh, things as, as information problems, right? You know, it's like, well, if we knew this stuff, then we would, we would behave, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, what I'm, what I'm learning, and, and this is, I think, very frustrating for me, because I don't know how to address this problem as well, is that it's not an information problem in most cases, it's a love or a desire problem. Um, mm. there, there's a great book uh, by, um, uh, oh gosh, um, I think it's James K. A. Smith. James K. A. Smith, you got yeah. it. You are what you love, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah. You are what you love. Mm -hmm. and, and he's and he he really I think drills this thing home, mm -hmm. is that um, you know, our problems are not information problems generally. You know, because we can have all the right information and still not do what we're supposed to what we we're supposed to do. It's like you know, people thought you know, well, you know, if we if we put these labels on cigarettes, people will stop smoking cigarettes. Right. But it was really maybe like more of a campaign to look, make smoking look uncool that was more effective, right? Yeah, because people desired to to not look, you know, gross more than they desired, you know, to to, <laughs> to not die, um, and <laughs> um, and so, for, 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 you know, with that in mind, um, we're not dealing with an information problem; we're dealing with like a, like I say that like a love problem or a desire problem. So that's a pastoral issue, mm -hmm. really, because I, 
I can give somebody all the right information, but if I don't know how to reach them at, 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 at you know, where the rubber meets the road, where it's important to them, then, you know, I might just be you know, like talking to a tree. So, um, you know, your, your work is more focused on the role that pastors need to play than mine is, which I think is really helpful. Um, so what specifically would you like to see pastors doing? Um, and I'm, you say this in the book, but I just kind of want to give you an opportunity to explore it a little bit here, if that's okay, to address this problem of, of Christian nationalism and, and what are the challenges to them doing so? And, and in particular, is there a love uh, that pastors may have of having a happy congregation or a full congregation uh, that may challenge, make them not want to address these problems? Because my understanding is that more pastors are aware of these things, being, this kind of thing being a problem than are willing to say it out loud. Um, and, and, you know, Greg Boyd stands as an example who I disagree with on a lot of things, but when he addressed this kind of Christian nationalism problem at his church years ago, half the church left. Yeah. And, and that stands as, I think, a, a very strong um, warning uh, to pastors who are hoping to have, you know, full churches with happy people. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, so what are the pastoral yeah. challenges and what can pastors be doing better on this issue? Yeah. Well, I, on that point about, you know, counting the cost. I mean, that's a real reality for a lot of pastors that are out there. And the measure of faithfulness is not necessarily numeric success or even financial viability as a, as a church. You know, I, I think of Hebrews chapter 11 and, and the, the hall of faith in saying some that were in faith, you know, they were able to shut the mouth of lions, but some were also eaten by lions. And, and there is going to be a dynamic, I think, pastorally where um, there will be those that, that try to, out of a sincere heart of love, be able to confront this idol of nationalism or political idolatry, and it might very well cost them their job. Um, there will be others that um, confront this idol, and it is almost like a, a cool glass of water of relief um, for um, the congregation and for the people to be able to have um, a sense of, you know, biblically sound sanity um, in the midst of a world that seems so chaotic. And, and so I, I do think the first point of this is that pastors do need to be aware um, that they, they have a role to be able to contend with any idolatry that is coming for the hearts of the, the people that they've been commissioned to steward and shepherd and love. And, and so in my community of West Texas, this is a really felt issue. And so I think I would be abdicating pastoral responsibility if I did not speak up uh, against this. Um, that said as well, I, I do think that the goal is not to just simply get a catharsis and just say, hey, this thing that's really bothering me, upsetting me, I'm going to tell you what I really think about it and just kind of emote about it. I, I think the heart is basically um, setting people free for something that is ultimately um, taking their their hope and their allegiance away from Jesus and putting on to something else. And so how this looks like in maybe some more pastoral conversations would be, include something like me sitting down across the table with someone at coffee and saying, Hey, I'm just noticing something that on your social media and maybe even some of your conversations that you seem to be very eager, very willing, very fluent, very passionate in your capacity to tell other people about your political outlook and what you feel like people should do in terms of their, their voting and in terms of their political allegiances. But it, it doesn't seem like you have that same level of passion that same level of fluency, dare I say, even that same level of hope in the kingdom of Christ. Now, why, why is that? Um, usually that's a diagnostic question that I found people can be able to be, admit, yeah, I probably am a little bit more courageous and willing to be able to share my political outlook with a, a random person than I would ever be in sharing my faith. And that at least creates this open door to be able to say, well, what is the functional good news of your heart? You know, um, well, we, yeah. we might be able to prioritize and say, we know the Bible Belt answer is like, well, first God and then all the other things that you can kind of put down that we know the right answer. But functionally, is the gospel our hope? Um, I, I think that's a, a huge thing. And then, you know, the second thing from a pastoral angle that I really would encourage pastors to incorporate into preaching and especially in pastoral conversations is, is to challenge people. You know, what what are your habits teaching your heart to desire? Mm hmm. What, what are the disciplines that are forming your hopes and your fears? Because if you are inundated all the time with the constant background of 24-hour cable news, 
and constantly addicted to uh, refreshing your social media and um, you go on these long YouTube rabbit holes where it's leading you from one thing to another thing to another thing, that is going to form your sense of hope and your sense of fear in a very worldly direction. And oftentimes it, it, it tends to form us in a very uh, uh, a powerful political outlook that yeah. appeals to our internal sense of confirmation bias. And we need to put those in the categories, not just as vegging out um, a, a, in, in moments of rest, but those are actually spiritual disciplines. Um, that are forming our hopes. And, and we need to understand um, um, a, a way to evaluate those disciplines and saying they're actually doing something to us. They're, they're habits of spiritual formation. And I need to evaluate if I'm allowing um, the word of God to penetrate me in the way that I've allowed these other words to penetrate me, especially not just in my mind, but in my heart. Yeah. 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 We, we, we don't want to pick up our cross. You want to be powerful and successful. And uh, mm -hmm. That's tough. Um, so um, th there, there is a question um, that I think you spend a little more time on in your book, which um, I kind of wish I had spent a little more time on as much as you did, because I liked what you had to say about it, um, which is if Christ has defeated the powers, which Paul informs us he has, um, why couldn't we have a Christian nation now? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, can you explain your answer on that? Because in my book, mostly I just kind of looked at these sort of views of like millennialism and said, well, you know, this might still be a problem in post-millennialism, but, you know, all millennialists, pre-millennialists could still acknowledge this as an issue. Um, but I didn't really maybe give a full-fledged answer like I should have. And I, I, I was, I liked what you said. I mean, I think there could be a lot to be said about that because I do think that, um, I think the ultimate like theological cheat code is this, you know, already but not yet paradigm right and and i think that that's exactly how we have to look at christ um delegitimization of the the authority that the powers had over the nations i mean the, the idea is that um the powers really were kind of given over to turned over to the idols of the nations and there was a, a spiritual darkness that they were um oppressed with but when, when jesus dies and rises again he he defeats the power of death and that is the the ultimate weapon of these powers. And so in that way, he triumphs over them. He puts them to open shame. And I fully believe that is why he says um, that he's been given all power and authority. And it's on the basis of that power and authority that we can now go into all nations and, and make disciples. It's because the peoples of the world are now um, liberated by what uh, Jesus has done. But Nevertheless, I, I would I would probably say that while they have been defeated and their powers have been delegitimized, they are not yet completely destroyed. Um, they are not yet completely vanquished. And we are looking forward to that day um, when um, evil comes to a, a, a final end. With that said, I do think that the powers are still active. And whenever you look at Ephesians and Colossians in particular, um, you see that there's there's still an active aspect of the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in. And you see that the, the powers are also actively engaged. And how I would characterize that is that the powers are engaged in deceiving and deluding the people of God to kind of fall back into those old idolatries. And, and so, again, um, in our flesh, we have been habituated towards idolatry. And, and so I think the, the powers kind of cooperate with our flesh and trying to entice us back into those old allegiances. And, and, and that's where we have to be able to live in the full reality of what Christ has accomplished and understanding that we are seated with him in the heavenly places and that he has been seated above all powers and all rulers, all authorities um, for, for um, because of his, of his ascension and because of his triumph. And so um, I, I think that already but not yet paradigm gives us the ability to understand that something has happened. Something has changed. You know, the, the promised Messiah of Israel is also the savior of the nations, but we're still living in anticipation for the day when those powers are, are thoroughly vanquished. Good. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we'd mentioned, uh, you, you may have brought him up in the conversation, Walter Wink's work on the powers. Um, and we, we both seem to have been influenced by him, although we don't, you know, demythologize the powers like he does. He's kind of a, you know, Boltmanian word. Um, so he sees the power structures of nations as being sort of spiritualized yeah. in scripture. So uh, instead of seeing these as literal spiritual powers behind the nations, incidentally, I, I think somebody who does that almost has to, 
go even further than maybe we would go because we're sort of saying there's the spiritual influence over the nations, but if the if the if the if the powers are not you know spiritual beings, then they're just this metaphor for the nation. So that that would mean that political power in itself was inherently evil. Um, <laughs> but um, but nevertheless, I, I, I found um, even though I, I didn't agree with his kind of spirit, I don't even want to call it spiritualizing because it's not it's the opposite of spiritualizing. Um, you know, uh, but anyway, this is like a remythologization okay. almost. It, this is how you could describe yeah. Wink. If, if Boltmon is a demythologization, Wink is almost a remythologization. Say no, let's 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 use that category because it helps us describe this experience that seems to be very real. Yes, yeah. It, it, except he doesn't. I don't think see them as as actual. So he sees them as these kind of. Uh, well, how do I describe it? Like um, power structures, for example. Yes. Right. Yes. So I think for him is that powers are individual rulers, you know, people, human beings, and, and principalities are like these kind of uh, structures, oppressive mm -hmm. political structures. Right. Um, and so even though I, I didn't agree with his reading, um, I did think there was something, this kind of emphasis on these sort of emergent characteristics yeah. that, you know, when, when you sort of have collectives or communities, Sometimes they do things that the individual actually maybe no individual in the group actually does. Yes. But, but as a collective, they do something different. Um, and so I, I thought that was an interesting idea. And, and I think it is true. Um, I'm trying to remember who makes this point. Maybe it's, uh, you know, it might be Wink um, in another book. Um, uh, maybe it wasn't the Powers book. Anyway, um, the, the, no, it wasn't Wink, but I can't remember the name of the author. Uh, anyway, so sorry. The the the, the point was that um, the way political power works is that nobody actually ends up being responsible for anything. Mm. And so, um, you know, if if for example, if, if someone is to be executed, um, the person who signs the order says, "Well, I'm not the one doing the execution. I'm just representing the the collective. I'm representing the institution." And I'm going to do my part to sort of sign the order. And the, then the jailer, you know, doesn't say, well, I'm not, he says, I'm not responsible for this. I'm just, you know, representing the, the institution and keeping this person in jail. And then the executioner or the, or the policeman, whoever, everybody along the line can sort of say, well, I'm just doing my job. I, you know, I may be, I may be actually killing the guy, but this wasn't my decision. I, I didn't right. sign the order. Right. And so, so somehow the, the state ends up doing things that no individual person in the state actually takes responsibility for. <laughs> Um, and so that I think is, is really an interesting insight. And, um, this is maybe slightly off topic, but, um, had you, have you read uh, Matthew Crossman's book, the emergence of sin? Yes. And it's, it's um, very much in, in line with what you're thinking and a, yeah. a deeply fascinating read too. Yeah. He, he does something sort of similar with like demythologization that I'm right. not really down for, but he makes a lot of really interesting insights where he sort of sees that, you know, when Paul talks about sin in Romans, he's saying, well, Paul's talking about sin like it's a person. Yeah. You know, and it's, and, and that has actually helped me too. I once again, we're off topic a little bit in thinking about sin because we always make sin this thing that individuals are responsible for in the yeah. West. And, and I think what maybe one of Crossman's insights is that sin is also something we're caught in. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, you, you, when, when, when Jesus' disciples, you know, look at the blind man and say, for whose sin, you know, who, whose sin that made this person blind or whatever, like there, there's a sense in which you could sort of think of sin as this property that shapes the earth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe it's not his individual sin, obviously, but yeah. know, sin is this thing that's led to all these horrible things. Um, anyway, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there, there's something that's really important to that conversation that you're mentioning there, which is... In many ways, the sin as a spiritual power gives us an ability to have biblical language in describing the corporate nature of evil and yeah. even the systemic aspects of evil that I think are not just something that belongs to, you know, the, the leftward liberal critique of society. It's deeply biblical. Um, mm -hmm. And so in, in Paul's literature, it might look like the power of sin. But in John, um, you also have like, you know, this triad of, you know, uh, uh, the flesh and the world and Satan kind of being coordinated together. And I do think that John's concept of the world is actually a great way of describing kind of like the the corporate 
nature of, of sin being something that is shared, that is societal, that is does have this structural element to that. And, and you might be getting to this a little bit later in the interview, so I don't want to get too ahead of this, but um, I, I do think that that is one way that we can understand the relationships between principalities and powers or rulers and authorities, which we would probably say, like, I mean, we actually think that these are spiritual beings. So there's a level of spiritual, true spiritual agency to this. But then this other term that Paul uses both in Colossians and Galatians, which is the stokeia, um, oftentimes, um, you know, translated the elemental spirits of the world uh, or the elemental principles of the world. Yeah. I tend to be of the persuasion that when Paul is using those terms uh, or the term stokeia, that it is talking about that more structural systemic aspect of the power's dominion. Um, and so in any ways, I would actually see the principalities and powers working in and through the stokeia to enforce their agenda, um, to be able to encase um, the the peoples and the nations of the world in this spiritual level of idolatry. And so I do tend to think that there is a structural element. I don't want to deny that. Um, I just think that um, it's it's probably best to apply that to stokeia rather than um, the, the principalities and powers. Yeah, the Stoikea thing is really fascinating. Um, and I, 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 I wasn't sure if I want to ask you about it or not, because I, it's such a complex and sort of technical discussion. And, and I don't know that I have all my ducks in a row on it, but it, it's something I've been spending some time on. Um, one of my next projects that I'd like to complete, and I'm already halfway through it, is like a commentary on Galatians that sort of looks mm. at this, the kind of the powers aspect of it, or yeah. Stoikea, that, that kind of emphasis. Um, and yeah, and, and that's where one of the places where Paul uses the stoikeia word, and it's really um, confusing in context, I think, if you look at it now, but I think it actually might be an interpretive key for Paul. Yeah. Because um, when he talks about the, the evil age, um, he's really, what he's really, for, for Paul, there's two eras. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, we look at Judaism, we think of Judaism and polytheism, paganism, and then Christianity as these kind of three different things, and Judaism's closer to Christianity and whatever. What Paul's argument in Galatians is we have two eras. We have the pre-Christ era and we have the post-Christ era. Mm -hmm. And both Judaism and paganism are in a sense, even though Judaism is, you know, revealed by God and, and, and um, 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 what's what I'm looking for, mediated by God. Mm -hmm. um, it's still, um, it's still not good in comparison to Christ. Right. And so Paul makes this really interesting parallel where he sort of says, uh, you know, to because he's really arguing mostly about uh, pagans becoming or pr pr people who were pagans, Gentiles who become Christian, and now they're being influenced to take on Judaism. Right. And he said, that's going back to what you had before. And it's like, well, what do you mean? That's what I'm going back to what I had. I was a polytheist. I did all the, and he's like, no, it's the same thing. You're, you're, you're finding yourself under this mediated, yeah. um, uh, you know, whether that's, whether that's, you know, for Jews, it's, um, you know, you have, God who sends the angels who give the law to Moses <laughs> and then Moses gives the law to you and mediates it. And then for pagans, you have these powers and principalities um, that give this kind of mediated, you know, very muddied, um, you know, view of God. Right. Right. And so for Paul, Paul is basically saying Jesus is it. Um, so then what are the stoicheia then? Um, is, is, a, is a tough question because I mean, it means something like elements. Sometimes it, seems to clearly mean like the basic principles of a thing. It means like the ABCs more or less, mm -hmm. I've seen that, you know, uh, but also refers to, it, like, to physical elements in scripture, like the elements of the world. And then there seems to be places, I think in Colossians where it probably is clearly speaking of like spirit beings. So then this sort of whole range of possibilities makes it really tough to narrow it down. But I, I was interested that you talked about it because I've, I've struggled to kind of, contain that whole idea. And I wonder if Paul is being maybe intentionally vague so yeah. that he can almost, you know, figure out a way to sort of put Jews and Gentiles under the same condemnation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, and I think the thing that's, it is a tricky term because it's, it's used uh, so seldom, not just in the new Testament, but it just in Koine Greek altogether. Right. And so yeah. there's, there's a, there's not a whole lot of data to work with, but the one thing I do see is, is that there is this deep, link between the stokeia and ethnic identity, ethnic allegiance, um, that that's what it's being utilized to be able to kind of conform to, you know? And so in Galatians, like basically saying like, we're kind of like, you, you, you're out of your Gentile identity, but now we're going to basically make you adopt Jewish culture and norms and 
basically you kind of have to adopt this kind of culture in, in order to be a part of the people of God. Um, yeah. You have to look like this. And, and I think that Paul is using that to say no, you know, and, um, and in Colossians, it's in, in some ways it's, it's operating in a similar, but also a slightly different way, but it's still kind of bound up in that ethnic kind of identity. And so I, I do, I do tend to think of that more in terms of the structures, um, yeah. and, uh, and kind of like the physicality. And so it's, it's something that is a, a interesting uh, conversation, even though it's, it's fairly technical, like what, like you said. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I think where I am is I, I think Paul is using it in two different ways. So I think for, for Jews, it's, it's the law and for Gentiles, it's probably these spiritual powers mm. um, in my mind. Yeah. And, and I, I, um, uh, in my maybe potentially forthcoming commentary, I like what Augustine has to say about it in his commentary on Galatians. Um, he says, while earlier Paul portrayed the law as a disciplinarian whom the Jewish people were under. Now he speaks of the elements of this world as guardians and trustees under whom the Gentiles were virtual slaves. And then he goes on to suggest that, quote, the guardians and trustees of divine providence are the fallen angels together with their prince, the mm. devil, and that these guardians act only to the extent permitted under the established emperor and the guardians and trustees of the world act only to the extent allowed by the Lord. And so there's a sense in which Judaism and, uh, you know, I guess you call it paganism, are these sort of temporary dispensations that God sort of says, this is going to be this way that I'm mediated, one way for the Jews and one way for the Gentiles. But when Christ comes, I'm doing away with all of it. Yeah. Um, anyway, it, it's, it's, it's a huge topic. And yeah, like you said, it's, it, it's tough to come down really hard on it because it's so unclear. But right. um, anyway, I, maybe, oh, maybe. I, I love that. That's I mean, it sounds something. fascinating, and and it sounds very Deuteronomy thirty two as well. Like I mean, you see that a lot of that paradigm seems yeah. to be informing that that uh, outlook on uh, his sure. commentary on that passage. Well, yeah, and, and maybe it's a little far afield because as much as I, when I really studied this in Galatians, I thought, is there a way that this relates more directly to the political stuff? And it doesn't really. Like, but mm -hmm. in, in the sense of that kind of maybe Deuteronomy thirty two worldview that you have a mediated experience of God, it's it's there, but it's it's not very direct. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so let's talk about that. Excuse me. So um, we've talked a lot about places where we agreed, and we had maybe some slight disagreement on the Stoicheia, but even like there, I'm not even sure exactly if I've come down on it. Um, but there are a couple areas where we may disagree a little bit. And um, to me, like, so when theologians talk about the, the dangers of nationalism, nationalism and this kind of stuff, they usually go one of two directions. So they either argue that politics is so morally fraught that Christians should stay separate from it, which is more or less the Anabaptist view. And, and I would argue even probably the early church view also, or they promote this kind of like a politics of Rodney King. Can't we all just get along Republicans, mm -hmm. Democrats? It, it's more like a civility thing, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, where do you think you land on that continuum? continuum? I, I'm, I think I lean more on the Anabaptist separatist side of things, uh, but I also kind of have believe in this sort of prophetic protest that you sort of saw in the American civil rights movement. Yeah. So I'm not entirely over there, but, but I think I'm more there. So that is something that I, I honestly, I need to give a lot more thought to because right now it almost feels like I'm different things on different days. Right. Um, mm -hmm. There are days I probably have my more Anabaptist moments, but I, I do think that probably my, my central figure that I would go to in that is, uh, is someone like Daniel. Um, where mm -hmm. I, I do think that the people of God are capable of having, possessing, and stewarding power in godly ways, even in the midst of a, a deeply pagan, compromised, uh, spiritually dark empire. Um, and that there will be times that, that that they're called upon to be able to to do that in a good and godly way. You know, one of the things about, and I think this is something that you might even um, outright say in your book is, you know, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity for their, the earliest church um, to be able to have any yeah. power at all. Because, I mean, every single bit of the New Testament is written to a deeply oppressed people, you know, uh, people that are kind of under the, the, the boot of the empire in that particular way. And so... I do think that there's a place for Christians to be able to um, be elect exiles in Babylon um, in the sense of like it's it's possible to seek the welfare of the city to which we've been sent in, in that mm -hmm. way. And that that in, can include a Daniel like posture of participation in the political process. I just think the, the crucial distinction is that we have to know who we are. Um, we have to have our primary allegiance to the Lord, 
and we have to understand um, this place of tension that we're in, you know? And mm -hmm. so uh, I, I suggest this in the latter portion of my book, but that I, I want to disciple Christians to be able to live in tension between Romans 13 and Revelation 13, this idea that there is, um, and I, this is one area that we probably disagree on, that like I would see Revelation or Romans 13 as basically saying like there is a necessary ordinance of human governance um, to be able to establish justice and to be able to restrain evil. Um, that That is something that is a, a part of um, God's continued stewardship of creation. Um, even uh, mankind's vice regency on the earth can be an outgrowth of that. But at the same time, um, these empires can grow into tremendously beastly things that are demonic, um, that are unjust. And so um, I, I do think that a Christian can be able to participate in the political process or as, uh, as members of the state. Um, but I do think that there might be times where Christians can and should under conviction of the higher allegiance that we have to Jesus say no to the state and mm -hmm. um, conscientiously object to what the state is compelling us to be able to do. Yeah. I mean, Romans 13 is such a thorny topic. Um, yeah. And, and you may remember in my book that one of my struggles with Romans 13 is that some of the things that Paul explicitly says, he obviously doesn't believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like in the sense, you know, that, you know, if you do the right thing, you know, everything is going to go well for you and, yeah. and, every, and, the, and, the, and the political powers will, you know, treat you well. And yeah, like Paul knows that's not true. Because <laughs> there's an irony, right? Like the, I mean, he talks about like, you know, the emperor holding the sword, but like he's going to use that sword to be, you know, to behead Paul himself, you know? And so yeah. there is a definite irony that we have to acknowledge there for sure. Yeah. 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 It, 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 I think people assume that Paul is, you know, to, to use a, a modern term, simping for the state. Um, <laughs> but, um, but to, to me, um, I, I may be, I'm at least open to this idea that, that some kind of um, um, political structure is necessary. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like getting too caught up in, in theorizing about what that might look like. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm, to me, at the very, you know, Romans 13 comes after Romans 12. And so there is this mm -hmm. distinction that Paul makes that the state uses the sword, the state is coercive, and Christians are not. The state is, a, you know, seeks the vengeance of God and Christians are never to avenge, right? And so there seems to be this divide that Paul puts Christians on one side and the state on the other. I think, like you, I don't I don't want to build that wall um, too high, I guess, because I do think that there could be some role for, there, there, there could be times in like voting or political activism or something might, might, be, might be useful. Uh, and maybe even, maybe even serving in, in some capacity in, in civil government. Um, but I think to me, I, I try to think about what it is that's the line that we don't cross. And um, what I keep coming back to is this issue of force, of coercion, of violence. And that seems to be what the early church was primarily focused on. It was, you know, we don't get involved in the state because the state is violence. You know, it's, it's the monopoly on force, right? Yeah. And, and, I, and I think there are ways to participate without um, participating in that violence, I guess. Um, but it, it, it's very fraught, I would say. Right? Yeah. Um, it, it, for you, is there a distinction? Like, I, I've never been happy with, you know, Luther's kind of two kingdoms thing. Like, you know, well, you can, um, you know, yes, as a Christian, you can't kill. But as a, as a representative of the state, of course, you can kill and slash and, you know, everything else um, and burn and that sort of stuff. That always felt just like um, schizophrenic to me. Right. Yeah. Um, for you, where, where do you see that line that, that we, if we, if we're going to serve in some capacity in civil government that we shouldn't cross? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a hard question and, and I would just, uh, you know, own the fact that it's, it's such a really hard question because at, at one level, um, there is some level of sympathy where I have with a, like a true just war outlook in terms of using, um, like this, the state having a responsibility, um, to preserve life and, and to basically defend against something that would come against life. And so, um, you know, just the, even the fact of like that, I do think the Nazis needed to be opposed. Like, I mm -hmm. think it's, it's something that like, that is something to me, um, that is kind of like maybe one side of the extreme of it. Um, yeah. but at the same time, you know, to, to serve in the, the modern day military, I mean, who knows what you'd be asked to do and what yeah. 
uh, potential compromises that could be asked to be made. And so I, I see it being something, um, and this might sound like a cop-out, I sincerely don't mean it to be, but I, I do think that Christians that serve in these capacities of really not just coercive authority, and so not just talking about people who hold a gun, um, like law enforcement or military leaders, um, but really anyone that holds a measure of power at all um, has the ability to oppress and dehumanize people, whether that's in business or any other type of institutional level of authority. And, and I think that we, we have to be a people that are led by the spirit of God rather than the spirit of the age. Um, we have yeah. to be a people that are that are led um, in whatever capacity or arena that God has called us to and gifted us to, um, to be able to exude the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit and bear witness to Christ. And the applications of that are so manifold um, that it's hard to ca- categorize it real neatly. Um, but I do think that that's why, you know, the spirit of the living God, the spirit that um, resurrected Christ from the dead dwells within us is to, to be able to lead us in those, those arenas and those places. And so, um, yeah, because like, I mean, again, to come back to the idea of even coercion, while I think it's a very, very good idea, like that can also be applied to non, um, physical force type of forms of coercion, you know, um, it could, it, it could be applied even in business or in, in other types of institutions. And so I think that, um, what we have to understand is that power, not just political power, but any type of power is a tremendously powerful form of idolatry. And that Mm -hmm. it can be something that um, very quickly is seductive to us in a way that causes us to um, operate more like the world and less like the kingdom of which we're supposed to be ambassadors. Yeah. Those, those are some good thoughts. I, 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 that's, I definitely think go a little bit more radical than you on this, but I, I don't want to spend. We could we could spend a couple more hours on that. Uh, so we'll, we'll maybe we'll wrap up that part of it. Yeah. Um, so um, and maybe also I would say that's another benefit of of two different people basically writing this book. Absolutely. Yeah. Your outlook and your perspective and your background, you know, gives you a certain way of looking at it that's different than my way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, that could be useful for somebody who maybe wouldn't find my book as useful. Um, and so anyway, so I'm, I'm glad that you wrote it. So how is your book doing? And I, I, I hope it's out there changing minds. I've seen uh, you, you've been doing you know, different interviews and appearances and you know, physical appearances as well. Um, so do you feel like it's doing pretty well for you? Man, I, I think that for what it is, which again, this is a book that was based on a master's thesis. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's done well in terms of that. Like it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be dethroning Harry Potter, um, anytime soon in terms of sales, but I, yeah. I, I am grateful that my, my goal in this was to just be one voice in this conversation. And, and really I wanted to be a pastoral voice because again, there's, there's a lot of us, especially sociologists that are talking about this issue. A lot of political scientists that are talking about this issue. There are yeah. very few pastors. Um, that are talking about this issue. And I, and I wanted to be able to add my voice to the course in that way. And so I think for what it is, it's exceeded my expectations. Um, yeah. And it continues to be, I think, a relevant issue um, that is constantly um, and almost on a daily basis, um, relevant and timely. And so um, I'm, I'm hoping to just simply be one of many voices. And, and I'm grateful for your work um, as well. I, I read your book and I really, really appreciated it. And it's, it, it is affirming um, to know that, like, I mean, the, the Lord is bringing this up, not just in one mind, but many minds. Um, I, I talked to you before yeah. we, we even started recording the, the show of um, coming across a, a podcast, an interview of Tim Mackey of the Bible Project, um, who himself, I know, is someone who has appreciated Michael Heiser's scholarship. And, yeah. and he was applying um, the, this doctrine of principalities and powers to nationalism. Um, uh, and I really do appreciate um, that this is an idea that isn't just far out there because I mean, it, you, you, yeah. you kind of feel like, you know, the meme guy on the ancient alien show, whenever you're talking about like, okay, demons, you know, um, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's something that um, I think is far out there in some ways, but because of that, it's also deeply intriguing. And, and so yeah. um, I hope that it can serve the church. Um, and I, and I feel like even having the opportunity to have conversations about it, in, including this conversation helps clarify, helps, um, you know, uh, refine ideas in a way that they can hopefully become more accessible, more clear, um, more uh, helpful to uh, everyday Christians, you know, Christians yeah. that are perhaps in law enforcement or perhaps um, uh, in the political process somehow, some way, or, or Christians that are just so bewildered 
um, yeah. it, with this political moment that it can either um, give some ideas that would provoke conviction or hope um, that for yeah. the greater kingdom that we have in Christ. That's great. Yeah. And, and for me, you know, as much as I like to see a lot of other people become Christian anarchists like myself, if, if there's a general shift in the church where people, like, where if, if, if 50% of the church was with you and 5% of it was with me, I'd be really happy about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hear that, you. That total shift of kind of dethroning the state and kind of relativizing uh, the, the importance of power uh, and, you know, um, seeing the kingdom of God is so much more important than, than the nation that we're part of. That would be an enormous and, 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 you know, wonderful shift. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad that it's not just, you know, the weird kind of anarchist book that's out there that you're also doing that. And, and I think, uh, I, um, to me, you, you mentioned Heiser, it's really in a way just kind of following through with what Heiser Heiser's pointed out as in the scholarship. It's yeah. just kind of following it to its logical conclusion. Um, and, uh, I hope he's, I hope he's doing okay. Cause I, I know he's, he's been sick and, um, so Absolutely. obviously any prayers for him would be wonderful because he's, he's been such a positive, I think, influence on, on not just scholarship, but people who kind of want to dig deeper, who are not necessarily scholars. Um, so yeah, uh, well, David Ritchie, author of why do the nations rage? I want to thank you for being on Cantus Firmus. <laughs> yeah, it's a great book. I have the Kindle version. I, I, wish, I wish I could hold it up, but um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But I, I've got it on Kindle, and it's uh, absolutely a, a worthwhile read. And, and I wish you all the success in the world. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I really enjoyed the conversation. I'm just grateful for your witness, for your voice, brother. Oh, you too. Thank you so much, David. <laughs>